Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. With all the drama surrounding the Catholic Church and children, it's easy for the good men of the cloth to be lumped in with the bad. In fact, it's even easier for people to turn away from God because they think God is behind the bad things that bad men do. Father Vassilo was what I would like to call an old-school priest. He was in his forties, in great shape, and he did a lot for a little town. He visited the sick and elderly, and consoled and counseled troubled youth teams. But he was also a man of the world in many ways, so seeing him return from a rabbit hunt with several of the local hunters was nothing out of the ordinary. Over the years, as he got into his fifties, people really came to love him as both a priest and a man. He could be found in the local pub, cheering and screaming along with the other guys. Then came the day the trouble started at the Bacon family's residence. Yup, the family's real name was Bacon, and they started to have problems with what the wife was calling ghosts and shadows on the back side of their house. The word quickly spread around town, and rumors spread that the family was into black magic because they rarely attended mass, and their son was one of those really strange fellows. He was quiet and reserved, but with crazy eyes. Turns out he was just afraid of people, but nonetheless, he gave off that serial killer vibe. I remember the day Father visited the house. It was after Saturday Mass, and everyone was talking about it. The family lived within walking distance of the church, making it even more perplexing why they had never attended Mass. Me being a young kid, I followed him as he left the church, walked up to their house, and knocked on the door. They greeted him with open arms which I thought was odd for some magic-practicing pagans. And he went inside. Now, pause right here and let me say this. Yes, I was out of line for what I was about to do, but I was a bored kid from a small town, and there was nothing to do then. No video games. This was my way of passing time, being a snoop. And lucky for you, because you wouldn't have no clue that this took place, except my eyes and ears beholding it. So, I sneak over the fence and right up to the window and eavesdrop. They're talking about what happened, and Mrs. Bacon was saying that when she prays her rosary and walks about the house, she sees these things outside that look like men, that they stare at her from the trees, looking into the window. Mr. Bacon chimes in, cutting her off. 
and says he has never seen such a thing and that he is worried that his wife is losing it in her old age. Mr. Bacon was a grumpy old man, petulant and irritable, and his wife was the polar opposite, as kind and sweet as she could be. It's amazing how rumors can change how a person is perceived. These two sound like my grandparents, nothing more, not evil monsters, just people who kept to themselves. When father asked her to take him to where she saw things, and I'm saying to myself, there's no way he believes this woman. But sure enough, the next thing I know, they are outside, walking towards the woods. Imagine the scene. I'm laying on the ground with my left shoulder butted up against the side of the house, peeking to see what's going on. And he walks right up to the woods and says, I see you. Do you remember me? There is silence. Next, you hear a tree limb snap, which scares Mrs. Bacon so much that she takes off back into the house, calling for her husband to get the shotgun. But father doesn't move. He just stands there for a few minutes, then sits down on the ground and says, Will you sit with me? Then he begins to repeat that same homily he had just delivered in church, a biblical story about David. He sits there for 30 minutes talking to the woods. I'm thinking, okay, this man is crazy, out of his mind. Then he stands up and says, show yourself to me, or I would hurt you. That is when I can confidently say to you that had I not heard the reactions of Mr. and Mrs. Bacon, I would have sworn I had lost my young mind because this face pushes out of the trees the size of a grown man's chest and it looks like a giant's face except for the brow, which is massive. Father says, you have brought fear upon this woman and you must stop. Do you understand? As he is saying that, Mr. Bacon is saying, Lord Jesus Christ, what is that? It looks in his direction for a moment, then back at Father Vassalo, nods its head down, and then the face goes back into the trees. Right then and there, I lose it. Stand up, make all kinds of noise, hop the fence, and run home, thinking what kind of wickedness is going on. Thirty minutes later, father knocks on the door of our house and asks to speak to me. Tells me he saw me following him and he wanted me to keep what I saw quiet. People would panic and think that what I saw was a beast that men and women are not supposed to see or interact with. I agreed, and this is the first time I've ever told this story. Now get this. Following Saturday, the entire Bacon family was at Mass. I mean, not just that house, but the rest of the Bacons from two towns over. They all came. Father was with us until he was 68 years old. Then he was moved to another Providence. The people missed him. I missed him. And then one day, we heard he died. On to the next one. My fiancé and I live in the mountains of Arizona. One night, in the late spring, we went fishing at an old fish hatchery. We were only there for a couple of minutes when we heard something rustling at the pond next to us. At first, I thought it was just an elk. I assumed that because we'd been there a couple of days before and there were tracks in the mud on the shore. But my fiancé was worried it might be something else. So he made a fire to try and scare it away. After a while, the rustling stopped and we relaxed. Not long later, we heard a huge splash on the other pond. We thought that maybe a mountain lion or bear had jumped in trying to get some of the fish. As unrealistic as that seemed, we just didn't know what could have done that. After the loud splash, we didn't hear anything for a long time. 
until suddenly there was another huge splash, but this time in our pond. I couldn't see where it had come from or what had made it. I was starting to get creeped out. Plus, the fire was dying. So all I wanted was to leave, but my fiancé didn't. He wanted to stay and fish. Even as we debated leaving, we heard more rustling in the reeds near us. That was enough for him to relent, because without saying a word to me, he started packing things up. I asked him if we were leaving, and he simply uttered yes. He turned, doused the fire, and told me to grab everything I could. We left the car near the entrance, which was a long walk down a long dirt road, then across a meadow and past some other ponds. Just knowing we had a long hike out made me even more nervous, because as we gathered everything, the rustling continued. Determined not to leave anything behind while simultaneously not trying to panic was a feat. We managed to get it all in our packs and headed out. Every couple of seconds, my fiancé would look behind us. He never mentioned he saw anything, but like clockwork, when he looked back, he began to walk even faster. I asked him what he thought it was, and he told me he thought it was a bear. Whatever it was, I was terrified now, and mainly because he was so scared. Unlike him, I refused to look back at what he was obviously looking for. We were almost back to the car, and I was practically jogging to keep up with him. He was making comments like, once we get over the gate, we'll be fine, and I don't think it'll come this far. None of what he said filled me with confidence. When we finally did make it to the car, he kept looking back towards the meadow and acting anxious. We loaded up, and hastily, and sped off from the dirt lot, and onto the highway, like Smokey and the Bandit. He slammed the accelerator down and raced away. After we were miles away, I turned to him, and asked if it was really a bear. His face was ashen. With his fingers white-knuckled on the steering wheel, he replied, I don't know what that was, but it wasn't a bear. He described the animal he'd seen. He said it was as big as a bear, but it looked like a half-dog, half-crocodile mutation of some kind. He said it had scales or leathered skin. What was truly terrifying was it had looked directly at him. The two had looked at the other long enough for my fiancé to notice the creature's eyes were all black. He also felt like it was studying him, like it had some kind of intelligence to it. He went on to detail more. He said after they were headed back to the car, he looked back and saw it watching them. It was sitting on top of the hill by the pond looking at us. This is why he began to walk so fast, he said. He wanted to run, but he felt he didn't want the thing to perceive them as prey. So, he walked with a stiff back and did his best to ensure they didn't seem panicked. He went on to tell me that he saw it had come down the hill and was still looking at them, which in turn made him walk even faster and tell me the bogus lie about the bear. He did this all for me because he knows very well what a chicken I am and that I would have gone into a full panic and ran screaming. He then continued and said that when he looked back again, the creature was in the field, still far away, but clearly following us. Then another time when he looked back, he said it was on the road behind us, walking like a cat does when stalking its prey. I think it was the cat-like behavior that freaked him out the most. I've never seen him so scared before, and I didn't know if I should think he was just seeing things but he swears up and down he saw whatever it was. We came home and looked up giant alligator dog sightings and came across the Doyarchu. They're supposedly mythical creatures from Ireland. The descriptions of it sound amazingly accurate to what he told me on the drive home, and we kind of scared ourselves wondering 
if the second splash in the pond could have been a second one. But I do have to ask, what is a mythical creature from Ireland doing in Arizona? After a few days of restless sleep and my mind spinning about the incident, I've come to believe he saw something. I asked if he wanted to go back, and he sworn he'll never go back there again. On to the next one. In Sussex Burrell, Sussex, New Jersey, near Route 23 and 284 near Wantage, in the weeks between May and June, strange bellowing noises were heard, which were at first thought to be cows or deer, but the neighbor's dog seemed to bark a lot when I would hear the noise. The noise also seemed to move around and grow louder and softer. It was almost like an ape or something. It was very intense and bellowing and drawn out. On numerous occasions, it woke me out of a sound sleep. Several people have heard the noise, including my friend, who lives about three blocks away. The noises, we started to think, were from a bear because several overturned garbage cans were found in the morning, my brother said and because the sound just seems like it would be from a large animal. Even though there are a lot of large surrounding woods, bears were seen in the burrow one time in the 19 years I've lived there. The noise seemed to become less frequent. We attempted to record them, but did not have the proper equipment. I recently heard the Bigfoot sound recorded in pen, I believe, and let my friend hear them, and we all seemed to feel they sounded quite similar. If I hadn't heard that, I would have just attributed the noise to a deer or a bear. On the first occasion I heard them, I was sleeping. Then I called my friend on the phone to see if her and her husband could hear it, and they could. My brother heard the noises when he was leaving for work at around 4. It was early in the morning. Hours were between 1 a.m. to after 4 a.m. There is a lot of forested area and a quarry surrounding the burrow as well as many fields. On to the next one. Near the Garden State Parkway, there was a night sighting by motorists near a wooded area in Burlington County in the Pine Barrens. It was a man-like creature, around seven feet tall and covered with hair from head to foot. The head was also hairy, except for the area around the eyes, cheeks, and mouth. The creature looked grayish in color, from the car headlights, in a split second, it turned and looked at the witnesses and, at the same time, lifted its leg over the guardrail and disappeared into the woods. On to the next one. In Burlington County in New Jersey, it was approximately 9 to 9.30 p.m. My mother and I were heading home from the mall in Tom's River. I exited the Garden State Parkway and came up to the stop sign, stopped, and turned left. I had my high beams on, as this is a high deer area. It is predominantly wooded for the few miles drive into New Gretna. As I approached the overpass of the parkway, we both noticed this man-like creature standing alongside the guardrail. My mother said, What the heck is that? I had the same thought. Here stood this man-like creature, approximately seven feet tall, covered with hair from head to foot. Its head was so hairy, also, except for the area surrounding the eyes, cheeks, and mouth. It appeared grayish in color from the headlights. In a split second, it turned its head and looked right at us. At the same time, it lifted its leg over the guardrail and disappeared down into the darkness of the woods. My mother wanted me to turn around and go back. I was too shocked and too scared to. The fact that we were two women alone on this dark road was not a good idea. I did, however, go back to that very same spot the next morning to see if there was anything there to prove further what we had seen. That part of the woods was so overgrown with briars and horrible thorn bushes, nothing human could have walked through there without being torn and shredded to pieces. To this day, each and every time I get off that exit, off the parkway, I slow down and look around in that area. 
What I saw made a believer out of both my mother and I. After the incident, I went back to the area only to see lots of briars and thick thorn bushes. It was dark and clear, a warm summer evening, pine forest area. When exiting this exit, you'll come to a stop sign. Directly in front of you is an old hunting lodge that I'm not sure is functional. This is where I turned left. I told the story to some locals there. I was told that some of the local people said there was something out there. On to the next one. In Sussex County in New Jersey, we were at Oktoberfest at Great Gorge. We were out on the back deck, which borders the mountains and the golf course. My brother-in-law and sister were with me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw an approximately seven and a half to eight foot tall, large figure that walked with a long, steady gait, with long arms and a thick chest. It walked steadily down the mountain, glanced at us, and continued to walk. We all looked at each other before running inside. We all saw the exact same thing. There were only three witnesses. We had returned from barbecue and were smoking cigarettes outside. It was approximately 8 p.m. It was a cold, damp evening. It is mountainous valley. On to the next one. My grandfather worked from the late 1950s to the early 70s as a landscaper on the Duke Estate in Somerset, New Jersey. When he told this story to my sister and me, he was foggy when giving the exact date, but he was still very sharp and explained it with incredible detail. My grandfather's job was to manicure and care for the lawns in the north section of the property, whatever that meant, and other various duties. He said that in the summer of 1972, one August afternoon, he was told by the head groundskeeper that he would be working overtime and that he was needed because a shipment was being delivered from Wisconsin. They needed about eight men to unload a crate and bring it into the garden area. That night, the truck arrived and it was getting late. The men who were asked to stay late for overtime were eager to get things done and over with and be on their way. When the truck pulled up, my grandfather said the crate was about eight feet tall and five feet wide. When he asked what was inside it, the one in charge said they were exotic trees. What happened next was enough to make half of the team get up and walk off the job and not care about the consequences. When the men started pushing the crate off of the flatbed truck, a blood-curdling scream was unleashed from within the box. All of the men let go of their grip and the crate fell to the floor. As everyone jumped back, Realizing that this was anything but a tree, the head keeper did all he could to save the content's real identity and said that there was a black bear inside of it. While the men were regaining their composure, most of the help walked off the job. They said they didn't want to get hurt or mauled dealing with a wild animal without the proper safety equipment, so off they went, including my grandfather. Only two men stayed to finish what they were asked this was what was told to my grandfather. The two remaining men managed to get the load onto a dolly and then drag it into the garden compound. While guiding the crate down the main path, balance was lost and the creature came off the wheels. The crate hit hard enough to crack the sides of the crate and loosen the side panel, which fell off and exposed the content. What the two remaining men witnessed that night was enough to make them seek employment elsewhere. What I am telling you now was how it was told to me. Inside the crate sat a creature that had the shape of a man, but was anything but a man. They couldn't give a height measurement since the creature was in a sitting position, but they said it was huge. It had the shape of a man with a very large frame, only it was covered with black hair. The creature was strapped down and had shackles on his legs and feet and arms. The face didn't look like a man, but had some human features. The worker said it looked more like a monkey or a gorilla. The hair was extremely long and dirty. At one point, one of the men said they thought this thing was trying to speak or communicate with words, 
but all it did was keep on drooling. They were under the impression that this creature was heavily sedated because it couldn't keep its head up straight. It rested its head on its chest. A couple of inches away from the creature's head was an empty water bottle nailed to the wall. On the other side of the creature was an IV stand connected to the wall and stuck to its arm. It might have been used to feed this creature during the transport. One of the oddest part of the story was that my grandfather was told that this creature was sitting on a rocking chair. I could never understand this. After thinking about it, though, I think it was maybe to prevent this thing from getting cramps during the move. They also said that the odor was overpowering and enough to make anyone pass out. The combination of smells, of urine, waste, and body odor was rank. My grandfather was struck by the story until the very end. About two weeks before he passed away, my sister reminded me to bring it up again and confront him, which I did. There was no need to go over the story again because we both knew how it went. I just asked him, Papa, remember the crate you had to move in New Jersey? He just looked at me, smiled, and said, Of course. I said, Did you embellish it at all? He said, No. There was no reason to. It happened the way I said it happened. I said, Because now would be the time to tell me. He looked at me and said, You want to know if I embellish the story. The truth is, I am guilty of the opposite. There was so much that I left out. The story was just the beginning. Remember something. I worked there for two more years after that. There are things that a young mind should not hear. I said, but I'm not a child anymore. I'm sure I can handle what it is you have to say. Grandfather said, tomorrow, I will finish the story, come back tomorrow. But there was no tomorrow. Grandfather passed away at 2 a.m. that morning in a New York hospital. On to the next one. Interestingly, despite the overwhelmingly supernatural purpose of stick structures in art, most Bigfoot researchers attribute nothing but mundane purposes to stick signs. Everything from trail or territory markers to hunting blinds and even warnings for humans to keep out has been suggested. Attributing the keep out message to two trees crossed in an X formation in the woods is such a gross anthropomorphization of the big phenomenon. In his book, A Field Guide to Sasquatch Structures, author Christopher Noel documented 50 different types of common stick formations attributed to Bigfoot. Noel believes such structures are mundane signage that simultaneously meet the emotional, psychological needs of these creatures akin to traits found among autistic populations, and satisfy a desire for intense focus and the orderly arrangement of objects. Most Bigfoot stick structures do not appear very orderly. Another, far more complex order to the structures is suggested in The Vertex Correlation, a short documentary film examining a series of stick structures in Florida. The filmmaker casts the mundane aside as they suggest these structures represent an asterism, a pattern of stars. The filmmaker plotted three structures using GPS devices and found each to be five miles from the others, forming a shape corresponding to the winter triangle, an asterism including the stars Sirius, Betelgeuse, and Procyon. Not only did the position of the structures geographically correspond to the winter triangle, but their triangular shape matched the same angle. At least one of the structures aligned with the constellation Orion, of which the winter triangle is a part as it moves through the night sky. The filmmakers assert the structure's builders possessed some ability to look down upon the earth from a higher vantage point and Likewise note, the builders are geniuses, whoever they are. Adjusting our view of the stick signs and looking past the mundane, 
we must wonder if there isn't an entirely overlooked possibility. Could stick signs go beyond simple communication and suggest religion or even magical practice? Could they be idols of unknown Bigfoot god? Altars for strange ceremonies, a kind of spiritual keep-out sign akin to the hex signs placed on barns of the Pennsylvania Germans. In occult practice, Sigils are a kind of graphic spell. A symbol created by the magician is charged or imbued with power by various means, usually intense concentration or physical exhaustion. It isn't difficult to imagine stick signs as a sort of three-dimensional sigil left in the woods for purposes known only to their makers. Lisa Scheel documented a series of glyphs left around her Texas home by what she presumed was Bigfoot. She also found footprints, animals killed in strange ways, mysterious scat, and large urine stains. Along with the Bigfoot signs came other weird phenomena, UFO and other mystery lights, black panthers, and presumed to be extinct red wolf, phenomena inextricably joined to Bigfoot sightings. It is worth noting that when Shield moved from Texas to Michigan, the glyphs and other phenomenon began to appear at her new residence. The glyphs left for Shield included all manner of shapes and symbols created from sticks mostly, stones, feathers, and found objects. The various glyphs Shield photographed range from the seemingly random collection of sticks to V and X shapes and arrow designs. Scheel also documented a circle of sticks bringing to mind not only fairy rings and the Lishi tradition, but also magic circles in general. Magic circles are used in many occult tradition as a means of marking out a sacred space containing spirits and other entities, or providing a kind of protective border for the magician. One of the most striking glyphs Scheel discovered and photographed was what she described as a long stick with a V-shaped stick crossed over it a few inches from the end. Though Sheil did not make the connection, this description is identical to the Alhaz rune from the Elder Fukarth, commonly called runes, is a runic alphabet once used by Germanic people. The Norns, the three weird women of Norse mythology, shaped the fate of all things by carving runes into Yggdrasil, the world tree. The great Ur wild man Odin, Odin himself received these runes after nine days of self-sacrifice. He pierced himself with a spear, fasted, and hanged himself from the world tree. At the end of Odin's nine-day ordeal, he could perceive both the meaning and power of the runes. The runes are recognized not only as a writing system, but also as a divination method and a means of imbuing power. The Elhaz rune specifically is believed to perhaps represent the world tree and therefore the mystical power of the universe. The same symbol is alternatively known as the witch's foot. It is interesting that the witch's foot, according to the symbol, looks like a three-toed track or a bird's footprint, both of which have significance two tridactyl Bigfoot prints. Even the random sticks documented by Scheel and others may have a magical purpose. Claromancy is the magical system of casting lots for divinity purposes. Sticks, also bones, dice, and other objects, are cast and, depending on their position and relation to each other and or their surroundings, can offer a magical insight of some sort. The upside-down trees, too, may hold some spiritual or occult symbolism. Generally, inverted symbols in the occult are interpreted as having an opposite and sometimes negative meaning. If trees represent life, their branches reaching toward the heavens, could upside-down trees be symbols of death? Given our hairy wild man's connection to Christmas, it is worth noting that in the Middle Ages, Fir trees were hung upside down to represent the Trinity. It may seem outrageously bizarre to think of Bigfoot creatures casting lots, making sigils, or building star maps in the woods, but that is only because Bigfoot researchers have, in a sense, 
animalized our wild men in an effort to force one square peg of Bigfoot into the very narrow round hole of natural creature. It has become nothing more than a damn dirty ape. Cryptozoology, by its very definition, is the study of animals. The cryptozoologist searches for unknown or disputed animals. When looking at wild men, we are instead required a sort of cryptoanthropology. Of late, the trend even among ardent flesh-and-blood hypothesis Bigfoot believers is to refer to these creatures as relict hominid rather than mere apes. The theory that Bigfoot is just an evolution of Gigantopithecus, a prehistoric giant ape, has fallen out of fashion. Even the most practically-minded Bigfoot enthusiasts have begun entertaining the idea that these creatures may be genetically closer to humans than has been considered for a very long time. The Bigfoot community is putting away ideas of giant gorillas and dusting off our old archetypical forest friend or fiend, the wild man. Is it so outrageous to imagine, then, a wild man with some form of spiritual belief? It wasn't so long ago that we considered a hominid from which many modern humans still carry DNA, Neanderthal man, to be nothing more than a dumb savage. Recent discoveries of cave paintings, body adornments, and musical instruments have changed these notions of Neanderthals as club-wielding savages into a race of fellow humans with its themes, culture, music, art, and even rituals. A recently discovered gravesite of a Neanderthal child suggests ritual and possible ceremony used in the burial. Likewise, circles composed of broken stalagmites were found within a Neanderthal cave site. Could these be the first magical circles? At another Neanderthal site, seven bear skulls were discovered, all facing the same direction and a human skull on a stake in a ring of stones. These taken with cave paintings suggest that Neanderthal man possessed the capacity to grasp symbolic thought. It is in a far leap from symbolic thought to ritual and magic. If Neanderthals, hominids, but not homo sapiens, had culture and magic, then is it so bizarre to think that Bigfoot, a possible relic hominid, could have cultivated similar beliefs. On the other hand, if Bigfoot is not a hominid, but something else, something other, a creature unlike anything else on the planet, or a creature very much like the folkloric things that have always haunted humanity, then who is to say of what is it capable? Some First Nations tribes pass down stories of Bigfoot as magical practitioners, a tale from the Lakota Sioux regarding the origins of Bigfoot a tribe of what the Lakota considered to be a type of people. A certain tribe turned itself toward black magic and consuming human flesh in a time of starvation, and they became evil, and it actually caused some sort of change. Due to this, an evil tribe of First Nations arose that were basically what a lot of them considered to be Sasquatch or Bigfoot. On to the next one. In Big Marine Lake, about two miles west of Cory Swamp in Washington County in Minnesota, I was bow hunting and just sitting in my stand looking around, and it walked about 25 yards away. It was a long time ago, and I did not know about Bigfoot at the time, and told my partner I had seen a skinny bear because the way it swung its arms and hands. I just saw it walk by. If I had known at the time what it was, I would have reported it. This place is not too far from the St. Croix River. Have there been many sightings in Minnesota? It was in the woods near a large swamp. At the time, it was mostly farming country. On to the next one. In St. Louis County, near Duluth, Minnesota, a white furry Bigfoot, about 8 foot 6 inches tall, was seen walking across the yard and through the unfinished house by Bob McGregor, 11, and his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Donald McGregor. 
on to the next one. The sighting was near two harbors. My friend and I traveled on an old logging trail about two miles in my pickup in a heavily forested area about 20 miles northeast of Duluth, Minnesota, close to the mouth of the Big Sucker River. I had to stop the truck as we approached a very old bridge that had been washed out years before. We were deep into the woods at this point. The nearest house was probably four miles away, close to Highway 61. I had never been this far on the trail by truck. However, I have hunted grouse in this area on foot before, sometimes walking for hours. We got out of the truck and walked over to the small, broken-down bridge and looked around. No way to get across, so we started talking. All of a sudden, we heard a series of screams and howls in the area across the bridge from us. It was getting closer and louder. Being a woodsman, I checked the wind and observed that the wind was blowing our scent towards the screaming and howling entity. We could hear crashing and breaking of large branches together with the terrible screams and decided that it had zeroed in on us and that we had better get the heck out of there fast. The hair on my arms stood up and my adrenaline kicked in. Both of us ran to the truck and locked the doors. I rolled down my window on the driver's side as I was turning the truck around, and I could still hear the thing coming closer. I could not see too far into the thick brush, but I knew that it was close. We finally got the truck turned around on the narrow one-lane road and fled. My friend was so afraid that she didn't want to ever talk about it again. I am a native of northern Minnesota and have hunted, fished, and hiked many areas up there, and I have never heard anything like that before. I was also trained as a big game guide in Montana, and no animal fits this description that I know of. I now live in Auburn, Washington, and still do some exploring up in the mountains near Greenwater. I am armed when I venture into the hills now not only with a pistol, but with my camera. Another thing that I might mention is that I recently heard a recording of Bigfoot on the radio one night that made me get goosebumps all over again. That recording brought back the memories of my experience as it was exactly what I heard so long ago in northern Minnesota. No other sounds were heard, animals, birds, or people. The only other witness was my friend at the time. I no longer know of her whereabouts. We were enjoying each other's company, if you get my drift. I often thought about the scent aspect, as we were not talking very loud at the time. This thing started coming towards us. We were parked in this position on the road for about 20 minutes before we heard it. It was one hour before sunset. The weather was warm with a five-mile-per-hour wind, long shadows and absence of color in the forest, leaves still on the underbrush and trees. The area is heavily forested, lots of brush, tag alders, small creeks, poplar trees, ash trees, birch, and other hardwoods, relatively high ground, no habitations for miles. On to the next one. near Yucatan Township in Houston County in Minnesota. It was late October. I was raccoon hunting on a beautiful, still, and moonlit night. I was walking along a pickled corn strip at the woodline along the top of a ridge. My two raccoon dogs were hunting out ahead. I heard my old dog bark a few times, then come running by me with her tail tucked under. The other dog was young, but not afraid of anything. Where the old dog came out of the woods, he went in. With a loud, savage bark and growl, he came out also and stayed by me, leaning against my leg, growling and quivering. It was then that I heard a very low, moany-type sound 
which was very audible. I shined my light down into the woods, but could not see anything, as the land dropped off rather steeply into a large wooded ditch, maybe two hundred feet deep. It was then that I heard what is best described as a large rock being thrown and bounced into a brush pile. I hollered, who's there? Then it sounded like someone hitting a hardwood tree with a club twice. I then backed up myself, with my dog still looking downhill, growling and never leaving my side. I could hear whatever it was moving down the steep hillside, in the leaves and up the other side. That definitely ended my hunt, as the dogs would not hunt there any more. About two weeks later, after our deer season hunt was over, I saw a friend of mine and asked how his deer hunting went. He hunted on the very same land I was on. Usually, his party killed many deer. However, he said something was really strange, as they never saw any deer at all. Also, the property owner's cattle would not leave the farm building. I have always remembered this experience. While watching television at a friend's house, I watched a Bigfoot TV show, and when they mentioned tree-hitting sounds, it rang a bell. Could it have been a Bigfoot or not? I don't know. I just had to write about my mystery. It was a clear night with a moon. The wind was still. On to the next one. On the Cloquet River in Superior National Forest in St. Louis County in Minnesota, the closest road would be County Highway 4547. The time was around 11 p.m. in late June or early July. I'm not prone to exaggeration. My father is a naturalist. I've spent enormous amounts of time in remote wilderness, beginning when I was four years old and continuing to the present. I've worked professionally as an adult, as a park ranger, and a game warden in East Africa. At the time of the event, I was already personally experienced with bears, moose, deer, and once a cougar. Since then, I've worked around big game animals and seven kinds of primates, including mountain gorilla and chimpanzee. The old Finnish farmhouse itself was in St. Louis County, about 40 miles from Duluth to the northwest near Brimson, Minnesota. We reached the old homestead by way of a driveway that was heavily overgrown and at least a quarter mile long. To the north was a thickly wooded cedar swamp and stream that I've wandered in occasionally. These woods were part of the Superior National Forest to the east and west were some old, broken-down homestead building and fields gone wild, followed by more woods. To the south was the quarter mile of thick woods to the road. The nearest neighbors were quite some distance away, I would guess half a mile or so. The main house was located at the northern end of a grassy clearing about 40 yards north or south, and 60 yards east-west. A gravel drive with our cars parked on it came up from the south within 20 yards of the house. About 15 yards to the southeast of the house was a tall telephone pole with a yard light mounted on it. My dad and I had set up our blue two-man tent in this grassy clearing about 25 yards south of the house. It was night, and our friend's three children had gone up to the loft bedrooms and were awake talking a bit. My dad and our host were downstairs talking at the north end of the house. I visited with the other kids for a while upstairs. I didn't want to go to bed out in the tent while everyone else was having a good time talking. Then I went downstairs and sat with the adults for a while. Around half past ten, dad sent me off to bed. I went reluctantly. The moon was out and it was late, so I believe it was a partial moon and, if memory serves, there were some clouds scuttled across the otherwise clear starfield sky. The yard light put out a fair amount of light, 
so that I could see my way to the tent easily. The front of the tent faced the house, and thus the yard light as well. I opened the tent, got in, zipped the mosquito net closed. I took off my pants and shirt, leaving my underwear on. I then started to read a book without the aid of a flashlight. The light coming in was enough. After about twenty minutes, I was getting sleepy. I don't remember if I was still reading or not when I heard footsteps in the grass coming toward the tent. I sat up thinking Dad must be coming to bed, but the steps were coming from my left, from the west. The house was north of me. The steps came nearer, quiet on the grass, but unmistakable footsteps. Then, to my surprise, the shadow of two legs walking from left to right in front of the tent were cast on the tent fabric, and then the mosquito netting by the yard light. I saw the silhouette of the two legs from the waist down as they passed. Whoever made them came very near as they passed within ten feet. The steps moved off to the right a bit, perhaps thirty to forty feet, where there was brush cover, and were silent. I called out, Dad, is that you? No answer. About this time, the hairs on the back of my neck began to prickle, and a lump formed in my throat. My pulse was pounding. I was surprised at my sudden fear, but it had a hold of me absolutely. I thought it out in an instant. Why should I be afraid? No one here would hurt me, and we were far from any neighbors. Dad, are you out there? Not expecting a response. Then the footsteps began again, starting from where they stopped to my right and coming toward the tent again. I froze. I was practically choking in fear. I thought something bad was going to happen. The shadow of the walking legs was cast again on the tent door, this time moving to the left. The footsteps moved off to the left a bit and were quiet. Were they gone? Or were they waiting only a short distance away, waiting for me to do something? I don't know. They couldn't have gone far. I waited about five minutes, trying to breathe silently, listening with every part on me. Then I couldn't stand it any longer. I pulled on my jeans, pulled open the zipper of the tent, and, looking straight ahead only, bolted at top speed into the house, hollering alarm once inside. Dad and our friends were right where I left them. I told them what had happened, and they assured me they had been there all along. They also said that none of the kids had been down from the upstairs. I went upstairs and found the kids where I left them in bed. Upon hearing what had happened, they swore they knew nothing about it. I believe them. I also believe the older folk. The parents tried to tell me it was an overactive imagination, or perhaps the moon casting the shadow of a cloud on the tent. The legs of my visitor were a biped. They were large, tall. The stride, as I saw it, was smooth and steady. It was quite possibly a person, but what a person would be doing snooping around a remote farmstead miles away from any town in the middle of the night, quarter mile from even a road, I don't know. On to the next one. Hey, my name is Katie, and I had a terrifying encounter with what I believe to be a Sasquatch back when I was 15. It all happened nearly 20 years ago when I visited my cousin, Sophie, in a northern California town known as Petaluma. Very few people have ever heard of the place, but it's a rural, scenic part of the state that hosts a lot of farmland, so it's beautiful. But places like that host many mysteries, which involve people who go missing. Also, I don't believe that there is an accurate record of missing people that is available to the public. I think we only get the unofficial record that neglects the true count. It must be a tactic that's intended to keep the public from panicking. My cousin Sophie was one of those ranch-type girls. 
She's a couple of years older than me. I thought she was the coolest. When she wasn't at school, she spent almost all of her free time caring for and riding horses. And she was gorgeous back then. Boys always loved her, and I would have probably done anything to be just like her. It was a beautiful summer day. I had been there for around a week when we decided to go for a ride on a trail that Sophie hadn't used in years. If I remember correctly, the reason was that there had been a giant fallen tree blocking the path near the trailhead. The tree was much too big for most people to chop up, as it required special equipment. The village kept saying they were going to take care of it, but they took forever to get to it. Since it wasn't blocking a road or anything like that, they must have disregarded it as a priority. As we rode into the area, I remember thinking that it instantly felt different from the other trails. Since it had been so long since anyone had used it, much of the path was barely visible due to overgrown vegetation. It was cloudy on the day of the incident, and I remember feeling like I was amid a medieval journey. The whole area was so gloomy and beautiful that it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. But when I began to question why I don't live in a place like that, I'm quickly reminded of the potential risks. Sophie was riding one of her newer horses, whose name I believe was Dakota. Dakota was some type of horse that's known for being a bit more challenging to train. I suppose they're a bit of a stubborn breed. But Sophie was the type of gal who loved a good challenge, and I think that made her fall in love with Dakota faster than she did with any of the others. She felt a wild connection to the rebellious horse, and the feelings appeared to be mutual. But it was after we had been riding for maybe 45 minutes that Dakota seemed to lose his cool. Something had deeply disturbed him, and Sophie dismounted before she could get whipped off. I was worried when she landed on the ground because she stumbled a bit. I remember thinking that she for sure must have broken her ankle or at the very least sprained it, but she ended up being just fine. At first, neither of us had any idea regarding what spooked Dakota, but it was as my cousin was approaching him with the hopes to calm him down that my horse started freaking out as well. That was when I caught my first glimpse of what I thought was a huge man running through the thick vegetation off to my left. Before I had time to react, it leapt onto the path between Sophie and Dakota. I don't think it even glanced at Sophie. I don't think it even glanced at Sophie. Its interest was in her horse. Helpless, we watched as the muscular figure got down on all fours and ran toward Dakota. For some reason, it got so low to the ground that it looked like it was crawling. The odd angle of its elbow is one of the first things I think of when I reflect on the situation. I could tell by Sophie's body language that she had never before seen the creature, and she was clueless as to what she should do to help Dakota. Since they were moving at full speed, it wasn't long before both her horse and the strange animal were out of sight. However, we soon heard the awful noise of Dakota crying out from overwhelming pain. There was no question that he was already getting ripped apart. Dakota, my cousin screamed hysterically. I had never before seen her lose her composure and confidence like that. There was probably a good 15 to 20 seconds where we listened to the mauling of the horse, but then everything went as quiet as could be. I'm guessing that the predator must have broken that horse's neck. Please, let's go, I pleaded. I was already crying when Sophie finally turned to face me. I saw that she was as well. Knowing that nothing could be done, she climbed onto the back of my horse and we rode home. My Uncle Rob was already outside when we made it back to the house. Understandably, he wasn't expecting either of us to be crying and returning with just one horse. What happened? He said, wide-eyed, 
knowing something severe had occurred, where's Dakota? He had probably expected to hear Dakota had flung Sophie from his back and then ran off before she could get back on. There's no way he envisioned the story that we gave him. There was a wild gorilla in the woods, Sophie said, still crying. It saw us on the trail. The animal scared Dakota so badly that I had to jump off him. It killed Dakota. Uncle Rob didn't know what to say, but even though the whole thing was probably hard for him to believe at first, Dakota's absence was not to be taken lightly. I'm going for a drive, Uncle Rob said. I'll find our horse, don't worry. No, don't, Sophie said. It could hurt you. She had good reason to be afraid that her father might not come back. If that animal felt at all inclined to do so, there's no question that it would be able to tear a man to pieces. I mean, it managed to take down a full-grown, ill-tempered horse in what must have been under a minute. I'll be fine, Uncle Rob said. Just before Sophie's stepmother, Teresa, came out after overhearing the commotion. What's wrong, Teresa said, as Sophie and I turned to inform her of the incident. Uncle Rob hopped in his truck and headed toward the trail. Dad, don't, Sophie shouted, but he was already well on his way toward the path. Soon we found out from Teresa that her father claimed to have seen Bigfoot while he was fly fishing many years back. According to him, Bigfoot exposed himself entirely, revealing both enormous height and width. He said he had little to no neck and growled at him right after they made eye contact. The Bigfoot stuck around for less than a minute before heading down to the shore of the river. Whatever it was that Sophie and I saw, I don't particularly remember it not having a neck, but all the other characteristics matched Teresa's father's description. When Uncle Rob eventually returned home, he informed us that he didn't have any luck locating Dakota, or even any trace of him. He ended up filing a missing animal report, but, as far as I know, nobody ever got back to him with any news. Understandably, Sophie was devastated by the loss of that horse, and it was from there on out that she continually lost interest in riding. I spoke to her about that loss of interest years later, and she revealed that she still loved riding, but she didn't have the heart to risk walking another innocent horse into a Sasquatch's grass. She suspected that that same nightmarish scenario would have reoccurred even if she rode within the confines of her property. There's no question she suffered from deep trauma. I've always wished for something I could say that might encourage my cousin to become an avid writer again. If you'd ever met her, you would understand what I mean when I say she was born to do it. To my knowledge, nobody else within that household experienced another Sasquatch sighting, which seems odd when considering how close to the house we were when the incident occurred. I'm curious to learn more about the species, but... I don't wish to see another one. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!